Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the distinguished professor of entertainment technology at Carnegie Mellon and the CEO of Shell Games, Jesse Shell. Hey everybody, thanks very much for coming today. Exciting, Games for Change 2014, very exciting to be here. So I know it's late, so I'm just gonna get right into this here. Um, so a little while ago, uh, Justin Lydas from Amplify Learning came into my office and he said, hey, I wanna, uh, I wanna talk to you about Games for Change. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, I wonder what he wants to talk about. He says, yeah, I want to talk about how maybe, maybe you do in a talk there. And I'm thinking, OK, this will be great, an Amplify Shell Games team up talk. And he's throwing out concepts and topics. And I'm like, these are interesting topics. We started talking about how important caring is when you create games. And I, and, uh, and I said, so Justin, what does this have to do with Amplify? I don't understand. How does this all fit together? And he said, oh, no, I just. I just, uh, I like your talks and I, I wanted to kind of goad you into giving one. And uh, I said, oh, well, all right, so I guess I'm, so I'm doing it. And uh, the thing I really want to thank Justin for is this was a topic that I'd kind of thought about a little bit, um, but uh, at his prompting, I thought about it more and realized maybe I have some things to say. So this is all really new material, so uh, uh, hopefully there's, you'll find something useful in here. So one thing I find myself thinking about a lot is magic. You know, all game developers have to think about magic uh, from time to time because it's you know, part of fantasies. But, but I've realized again and again the things that interest me most in the world all are things that seem very magical. That's part of what's exciting about video games is video games and, and in fact all games are really very much like magic. All you, you write a little bit of computer code and suddenly there's a fantasy world and people are in it and they care about it. Or, or the same thing making board games. And of course, the idea of changing the world, I mean, that, that's by default something that's magical. So I know people here are kind of interested in magic. But at the same time, magic is something everybody makes fun of. The, we're not supposed to believe in magic. And if you do believe in magic, you're, you're considered kind of a strange or silly person, especially in Western society. Um, but there are a lot of really important things that are, are kind of in the realm of magic. And when I say magic, you know, I use a definition kind of like this. You know, that which influences the course of events by mysterious or supernatural forces. And by, by that, you know, mysterious forces, that's not, that's not so weird, the idea that there are things controlled by forces we don't completely understand. And we see this in many places. Certainly the notion of chi energy in the body um, that's central to Eastern medicine, central to acupuncture and acupressure, Western doctors tell you this is nonsense. There is no such thing as chi energy. You can't measure it, and they say it doesn't exist. But at the same time, this stuff works. So what is happening exactly? There do appear to be some channels of something in the body that, uh, that control a, a great number of things. So that's interesting and kind of mysterious. Many architects, certainly uh, Eastern architects and some other architects, um, Christopher Alexander, uh, for example, talk a great deal about channels of energy through spaces, channels of energy through cities or through buildings. And I think we've all experienced this, that rooms in your house have like high energy zones and sort of dead zones. So these channels of energy are a real thing in, in spaces. And of course in the office, there are also secret channels of energy, and a lot of them have to do with emotions and who has relationships with whom. When you just look at the office, you can't see them, but there are these secret networks there about who responds emotionally to whom. And it's very important when you're in kind of an office situation that you understand those. And very often, problems that you have on teams are about diagnosing this secret, invisible network. And, of course, invisible is important, you know, as, uh, as Antoine uh, de Saint-Exupéry says in The Little Prince, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And that's true, that some of the most important things in our lives are invisible to us. They are, they are powerful and they are invisible and we can't see them. And one of those invisible things is caring. Particularly for us in the, in the space of trying to change the world through games, Caring is something that is tremendously important. 
the, we, we make games like this because we care. But people seldom talk about the caring, they mostly talk about the games. Are the games good? No one talks about, well, is the care, was the caring good enough? You know, did the, did the team care enough? Um, and it, again, it's partly because it's something invisible. You know, you look at the team and it's like, well, who, wh where are the ones who really care? You know, it'd be great if you could pull out your little care meter and like, yeah, there's one and there, there they are. Those are the ones who really care about this project. The others just along for the ride, right? <laughs> now, now say you did know that. If you knew that, that's incredibly important information. And who cares and who doesn't care on the project? That's going to shape the nature of the project in, in a really significant way. So it's important that we know about that because the thing when people really care about a project, it shines through. It comes through in the game and you can see it when the caring is there, when that, that attention to detail and that, that attention towards having the game actually make a difference for somebody. When it's there, it shines through in the game. You can't always point to it in the game and say, ah, caring quotient 7.9. You can't always do that. But sometimes you play games and you get a feeling, you get this feeling that, wow, they really cared about this. Or even more importantly, the, wow, the people who made this, they really cared about me. They cared how I would feel and what this game would do uh, to me. In uh, my book of lenses, the final lens is the lens of your secret purpose. Because every, everyone who's involved in game design and development has some reason that they're doing it. But many of us don't know our reason. We just kind of got sucked into it and we're over there and we're doing it. And it's always good to stop and ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? Because that reason is the thing that you care about most. And it's important to know what you care about the most. In some previous talks, I've talked about this little set of four. You know, I, I sometimes suggest that, that game developers tend to fall into one of these four categories. And what differentiates these four different categories is the motivation. And in other words, what is it that they really care about? And so for this talk, I wanted to dive more deeply into that and talk about what does that mean and why, why do we care about that? So first I'm gonna talk about the artists. And um, so this is gonna sound weird, but I don't care, it's a game for change, I can say weird stuff. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I think differentiates artists from other types of developers, when I say artists, I don't just mean people who do graphic arts or, or, uh, or, or animation. I mean people who look at this as an art form. When you're a true artist looking at things as an art form, you usually, you don't care what people are going to think of it. And you don't almost even care what you think of it. The, what I see again and again with artists, there's this place that I refer to as the proto-world. This place where these things exist in pure concept form. And then one day, the artist just sees into it and sees that thing, and they see it, and there it is, and oh my God, this has to be here on Earth. I must bring it into reality. And they work and they work because that thing must be brought from the proto-world into reality. And once it's there, Oh, that's great, it's great that it's here, and that's, sometimes that's the end. That's, that's all the artist needs to do. And so, from the artist's point of view, right, they're, they're these proto-world objects, and they desire to bring them into reality. That's uh, the desire that they have. And I'm gonna have a dotted line right here which indicates, hey, I care about this. So dotted line indicates caring. Okay, so there's the artists, and that's what they're about. The second one are the fulfillers, and a lot of people in the game industry fall into this category. The fulfillers care about creating engaging experiences, and they don't want to just create them and just have them exist. They're not like the artists that way. They want to take these engaging experiences and they want to bring them to people who need them. People who are really excited about them, that like desperately want these experiences. That's incredibly satisfying for the fulfillers. Most people in the entertainment space are very much in this category. The third one are the humanitarians of which, of course, there are quite a few here at Games for Change. Humanitarians care about taking helpful change and similarly bringing it to those in need. So you can see they have a lot in common with the fulfillers, but helpful change is a bit different than engaging experiences. And then finally, there are the persuaders. What these guys care about is the money. 
and they want to take the money and bring it to themselves, <laughs> right? That is their goal. This motley aggregation is what constitutes the game industry, more or less. And it's interesting to think about these different categories. It's interesting to think about like, what category are you in, but it's interesting to think about what categories other people are in. Steve Jobs is an interesting character, because when you think about Steve Jobs and you think, well, which of these categories does he best fit into? He makes a lot of money. Maybe he's in the persuader category. He didn't seem to care about money very much, honestly. Engaging experiences, sort of. He had some interest there. Humanitarian, definitely and resoundingly no. <laughs> I think he sort of fits the bill most as an artist. He seemed to care the most about like seeing these things, bringing them into the world, and he wanted people to like them, but he, was, it's, it, it, he, he behaved a lot more like a, an artist in, from my point of view. Here's another very inspirational person, Fred Rogers. So Fred Rogers is an interesting guy because you know, he's doing, he's, he's doing a, you know, a lot of these things. He's, he's in the entertainment space, but he didn't really behave like an entertainer. He really very much was in the entertainment space as a humanitarian. His goal at all times, at all points, was to use the medium to change the world, to, to, to serve the public, and uh, to make the world a better place for children. Anyway, so it's interesting to think about that, but what we need to think about is how are these four going to get together and do decent games for change? Okay, here's how it works. The fulfillers get together with the humanitarians, all right? The two of them get together and they get very excited about not just making engaging experiences and not just making helpful change, but they get excited about making engaging, helpful transformation experiences, right? And that's what they do, and they're all excited. Look at us, we're together, we're making this thing, and that's great. But these guys cannot do it on their own. They need the artists, because they need this thing to have the greatness that artists bring to it. So the artists are bringing their proto-world object. They're happy to bring their proto-world object into here. This is part of reality, so that's fine. And is that enough? No, it's not. We need these guys. <laughs> we need these guys. Why do we need these guys? Because we need investment money. You know, somebody's got to put some money into this thing. And there it is. We're building wonderful, engaging, helpful transformation experiences. Um, but that's not good enough. Look, the fulfillers and the humanitarians, there's nothing here that they're caring about, you'll notice at this point, because what they want to do is they want to bring that stuff to those in need. And presumably those in need, like, are also interested in, uh, in getting these things. And that's all pretty good, except you'll notice the persuaders don't care about anything here so far. Right, so the persuaders are like, hey, 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 how about a little revenue action coming to me? How about some of that, <laughs> right? And that is uh, an important piece of it. Otherwise, you know, they might not necessarily have made the investment. So that is kind of what the machine looks like when it's working and operating well. This is what we make, and it's wonderful because all these guys are working together. All this genuine caring is happening. Everybody cares about things at the right place, and so the whole thing goes forward, and it's wonderful, and the caring all shines through. But I like this diagram because it's useful for sort of diagnosing problems. So I'm going to talk about seven different problems that you run into today. First one, fake caring. Fake caring happens sometimes. People pretend to care. Because how can you tell if someone's caring or not? Maybe they just want the job. Maybe they're just hungry. And they're like pretending to care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teaching kids to read. Great. You know, just tell me what to do, right? And you could say that doesn't matter as long as the work gets done. But it's not true. It's not true. Because when people care, the work changes. The work gets so much better. And so fake caring is a real problem that we have to worry about. And the solution is real caring. The notion of really, really authentic caring. And, that, and that the notion that we're going to value and, 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 and really take a hard look at authentic caring. Do people really care? To constantly be thinking about that with your team and with your organization. And if they don't care or if they stop caring, why? And how can I make that caring be more real? I love this quote from Howard Thurston. He was a magician, early 20th century. Long experience has taught me that the crux of my fortunes is whether I can radiate goodwill toward my audience. There is only one way to do it, and that is to feel it. You can fool the eyes and minds of the audience, but you cannot fool their hearts. 
If your caring is fake, people will know. But if your caring is real, you have the potential to have it shine through. And so it's important to value truly authentic caring. Okay, well, great. So we, we're trying to value authentic caring. What are our other problems? Weak caring. People are trying to care, but things are getting in their way, and they're having problems, or they're, they're, they're not sure if they should really care about this. There's a lot of things that can get in your way in terms of caring. Maybe they haven't even had time to think about it. One of the big solutions to this, I think, is a word that has become unpopular, faith. Now, faith, when I say faith, what I'm talking about People talk about, you know, you have to have faith. Have more faith. You can't have faith. You can't. It's not a choice. Faith is not a choice. Faith is a decision that your soul makes. You look inside your heart, and there it is. It wasn't a choice you made. I think I decided I'm going to believe in this. No, you just looked and you believed, or you didn't believe. Taking the time to do this and figuring out what's in your heart and what you really believe is valuable because that is going to help you magnify the reality and the strength of your caring. So just as an example, I know one strong cornerstone of my personal faith is I found that like I just looked inside one day and I realized I really believe this, that the universe wants us to help each other. There's no proof of this. I don't think anyone could prove or disprove this. But honestly, even if someone found a way to disprove this, if like God came out and said, no, actually, it's not set up that way. I really don't care. <laughs> I would still believe it. I'd still believe, no, 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 there's something else behind it. I still believe the universe wants us to help each other because it's just a cornerstone of my faith. Okay, problem three. Caring sometimes gets blocked. People really care, but something in the system blocks it up. Maybe the people who care the most aren't the ones who get to make the critical decisions. So they're caring, but the, it's getting blocked by people who don't care or who are confused or who don't understand. Or sometimes I care a lot, but I feel like I'm not making a difference and I get very frustrated. There's a great book called Give and Take by Adam Grant. It's a wonderful book studying the nature of people who are givers and people who are takers and how it affects their lives. And one of the things they found in this book is that a thing that makes a huge difference for people who have kind of a giving nature is whether they get feedback about whether their giving is helping. If they're not getting feedback about it, it starts to feel futile and they become very depressed. But if they get feedback that the giving that they're doing is making a personal difference for people, then, then they become rejuvenated and, and they have a lot of powerful energy and they give more and more and more. So that's a thing to think about. How can you get feedback to your people, to your team, about the difference that what they're doing is making. OK, so here's two problems rolled into one. One of them is, yeah, we did all this, but our game is bad, right? Now, that usually happens one of two things. The artist did a bad job, had a bad vision. It just didn't really come through right. Or in the process of making the game and delivering this engaging transformational thing, there was confusion or just mistakes, and it just was bad. Second problem, we haven't talked about this. Those in need, that little dashed line down there about what they care about, what if they don't care? What if you're like, wow, these people need to quit smoking. I'm going to make a game that helps them quit smoking. And that guy's like, I don't want to quit smoking. I don't want this, right? <laughs> no, Timmy, you need to learn algebra. It's going to be the key to your future success. I don't want to learn algebra. Get out of here. That happens. And a big part of this is bringing out the fulfillers who say, I know the tricks. I know how to make people care. So I'm going to give a short rundown on popular ways to help make people care. OK, so seven ways that games help make people care. First one, engaging people's curiosity. People might not care about a thing, but then if there's something intriguing about it, they want to find out more. And sometimes, once they, get, once they ask that question, that leads to more questions. And before they know it, they care. So thinking hard about how can I intrigue people not just how can I entertain them or get them excited, but how can I, how, how can, how can I really make them care? Um, oh, here's a great example of that. You're gonna, it's a game tomorrow that I hope you'll all go play. Some of my students at the ETC created. Uh, it's this game called Feed. It's going to be available to play tomorrow. If you look in your red envelope, you're going to find a card that looks like this. And this game is very much designed to incite your curiosity, because it's something a bit unusual. 
their game rounds. It's going to be over in uh, Washington Square Park. You can see right over there. That's over by the fountain. Look for the people with the balloons. Games run every 30 minutes. You're going to use a smartphone, and you're going to play this really interesting game about uh, trying to save, uh, save the world, about how to properly feed the world. But you're going to do it um, by running around in Washington Square Park with your smartphone. And their hope is that this experience is intriguing enough that people will care about it, pay attention, and, and, uh, and, and find out more about the issue. We'll see if it works. A second way to trick people into caring here, um, get them to care by putting their ego on the line. Right? That's the whole idea of the sword and the stone. Like, hey, yeah, somebody can pull it out. Like, well, I, I should try. Maybe it's me. Right? Because suddenly, it's, this is a judgment about you. People like a judgment about them. Those little ads you see on, uh, on the internet, hey, take this IQ test. Are you smarter than a fourth grade monkey or whatever? You know. <laughs> and people are like, I want to know. I mean, am I smarter than a fourth grade monkey? I want to see. My ego is suddenly involved. So ego involvement is a good way to make people care. We did a great one um, a few years ago with SimOp Studios, this game for firefighters. Um, it was uh, designed to educate them about a new piece of uh, equipment. We put, I, we put a, a leaderboard up. I've never seen such competition. Turns out firefighters are incredibly, incredibly competitive. Their, their ego was on the line. They, every one of them wanted their precinct, because we didn't just have your name. We had your precinct up. They wanted their precinct at the top of the, uh, the high score list. Uh, make me care by connecting with my fantasies. People talk about story, 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 story. Stop talking about story. Talk about fantasies. Games that fulfill people's fantasies intrigue them and get them very excited. I know this is kind of gross. Typing of the dead. Some people have fantasies about shooting zombies, but we want them to learn typing. Typing of the dead. <laughs> Type the zombies into oblivion. Thank you, Sega. This was an arcade game. Moving on. All right. Here's another one. Get me to make a plan. Plans are magic in our brains. Steinbeck talks about it of mice and men. He uses the phrase, a plan is a real thing, because plans are a real thing. Once you've made a plan, like, it's hard to deviate from that plan. I'm going to tell my Jake Witherell story right now. So across the street from our studio, we've got a little bakery, and they got cookies. And Jake buys cookies now and then. And they always have this sign up. But one day he says, you know, I don't, is this a typo? <laughs> 40 cents or three for a dollar 20. Do you mean three for a dollar? Is that what you meant to say? And they're like, no, three times 40 is a dollar 20. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know. I know that. But why do you need to say that? And they said, well, you know, we used to just say 40 cents, but once we put that up, people bought more cookies. <laughs> and Jake said, that's stupid. They said, well, whatever. What do you want? He says, ah, I'll take three cookies. Because <laughs> it's true. When you see that three cookies for $1.20, bing, the picture of you eating three cookies comes into your mind, right? And now you have to actively work to break the plan because the plan has been planted in your mind. And we do this in games all the time. You go play World of Warcraft or Diablo or something, and you see somebody running around, look at all that cool stuff, glowy armor, a glowy sword. Suddenly you've made a plan. I want to be that guy. I want that stuff. And suddenly you have all these in-game goals that you're going for just because you saw that guy and you thought it was cool. OK, another popular one, completion desire. We like to finish things. This is connected in with goals, but it's different. We like checking off everything on the list. I remember playing Laser Blast, the most boring game that Activision ever made. This game is so boring. However, if you play it for hours and hours, I think it's eight hours straight you have to play of the same repetitive 11 seconds of gameplay for eight hours, you will see six exclamation points on the screen, and you will have gotten a million points. And yes, I tried to do that, yes. <laughs> because I wanted to finish it and say Laser Blast was done forever. So that's a way to get people to care. And we see this all the time, right? You see it in uh, Dragon Box. Like, check it out, all the puzzles. You got to finish them all. People want to finish all the puzzles. Social pressure. When there's social pressure, people want to you know, they, when other people are doing something, they want to be part of the club, they want to kind of, they want to have higher status than other people. Social pressure is a way to get people to care, either online or in person. Um, we use this at uh, this uh, Race for the Beach experience we did for SeaWorld. This is a Shell Games project. 
the idea is the whole family plays together. And once the whole family's playing, like you want to finish and you really, you really want to sort of do this together. You, know, you don't want to bail out because you're letting the whole family down if you, if you bail out. And the last one I'll mention, let me break the rules. People love breaking the rules. This is a game about building cities. I'm going to put a tornado in. That's not the goal of the game. That's going to smash up your city. People love to break the rules. And, and, and people will care more about if you let them break the rules. OK, so we talked about ways to, uh, help, to help the people who are in need care about the game. But let's talk about other ones. Two related problems. Hey, we couldn't get investment money. We got a great idea, but nobody wants to invest. If we could only get the investment money, everything would be set. Really? I'm going to say that's not really true. Because if you had this part, and the money people were like, oh my god, that's going to make a ton of money, they'd bring the investment. Usually, they don't bring the investment, because they look at it and they see you know, no revenue. That's what they see. They say, this is not sustainable. We'll get this thing built. We'll get it out there. But it's not going to be sustainable in the long run. Um, and, and, that, and if you can't get that, you're going to lose the caring of the guys with the money. But if you can find a way to make it sustainable, suddenly they care, and the money helps make the machine go. Now, there's a lot of challenges with that right now. And a big part of it is we don't have a good marketplace. You know? Ideally, we would have this beautiful marketplace where the people who make the games get connected with the people who want to play them, and everybody's all excited and they all care about that. Right? And there'd be opportunities to talk with other people who play the games about which games are best, <laughs> et cetera. Right? And that would let people kind of charge a fair price for their games. Right now, we're in a world where the markets are messed up. We've got, we've got like the iOS market where, is it free? Is it 99 cents? 99 cents is too expensive. Have you noticed they don't sell textbooks at Barnes & Noble? Have you noticed that? It's because if you're Barnes & Noble, look, that book's 5 bucks. Oh, this book's 12 bucks. How much is that? $90! It would seem insane, right? That's why textbooks are in a separate market. We don't have that market right now. Someone needs to build that market. It's going to make a huge difference if we can find a way to make a market where the prices are, are set in a way that can be sustainable in the wrong, long run, but that are still perceived as a good value. Anyway, that's all I have to say, so thank you very much. So now I say that's all I have to say, but I'm kind of lying, because now we're about to transition into the award show. Woo! Actually, Jesse, that's not true. <laughs> like we're, I care. We're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to transition into the award ceremony. That's what, that's what I meant. <laughs> See you in 15 minutes.